new to me and that is great and I want to share something that happened to me a couple of days ago which will have an impact on how I show up how I am showing up here today so first of all I'm a Mac user you need to know that and therefore I use Keynote for my slide presentations and when I started to kind of prepare for this session I went looking for I've done this particular talk before so I went looking for my slides on this particular talk not that I repeat things that I talk about but I always use it sort of as a foundation and then change things around well I could not open my slide presentation on this topic it just would not work and I went back into my time machine I went back into my external hard drive and I could not for the life of me open the art of career development keynote presentation so I left it like that and uh, I said to myself well you know I have my notes my outline for the for the talk so I'll just put together a new slide deck and that'll be that and then Larry King died now I don't know how many of you are familiar with Larry King but Larry King is an iconic American broadcast journalist he died at age 87 just a couple of days ago and he used to have a show on CNN called Larry King live and what he did on that show was he interviewed people famous people from all walks of life now I wasn't a huge Larry King fan but when I tuned into his show on the on the odd occasion I realized there was something different about this man there was something special about him and as I was listening to the news about his passing I discovered that Larry King rarely if ever prepared for his interviews he didn't write down questions he didn't make notes what he wanted was to be completely present with his interviewee he wanted to be right there to feel what was going on and he would make up the questions on the spot so I coupled the death of Larry King with the universe removing my keynote presentation on this topic to just appear here before you like this it's me and it's you and it's the camera there are no slides I have no notes <laughs> so that's the way we're gonna do this I want to start us off by just doing uh, a short little grounding activity if you don't mind I'm gonna ask you if you're sitting just sit with your feet on the ground if you're standing stand with your feet on the ground if you're driving keep driving <laughs> don't do anything but drive and put your hands on your thighs and close your eyes and just take a deep breath right from the belly keep your eyes closed now I know many of you are at home right now working from home maybe you're in an office and there's probably all kinds of stuff going on around you maybe there's kids maybe there's noise maybe there's distractions and I'm gonna ask you to tune those out just for a moment and tune into your body what's your body saying to you right now is there any stress going on Does it feel comfortable and just pay attention to where those bits of stress might be in your body take another deep breath and if you've ever been in a session with me before you've probably heard me say something like if you want it what you experience in the next 30 to 40 minutes can actually change your life and that's also a bit about Larry King it's about being present it's about being conscious and it's about actually doing something about the information that we're going to share with each other take one more deep breath And then I just want you to take a second to express gratitude for being here, for having what you have, 
for being able to practice in a field that I think is one of the most noble in the world, to be able to help people to find their passion and lead great lives. And I feel very blessed to be a part of this community. And when you're ready, open your eyes and come on back. All right, so I hope you're all grounded and I hope you're ready. So the art of career development. Why did I call this session the art of career development? In the synopsis, I mention what I think is the science of career development, those things like gathering of tools, uh, research, courses that we take, preparing us to do the work that we do with our, with our clients. The art of career development is something different. The art of career development has to do with the why, why are you doing what you do, and how are you doing it. The how is the difference between Herky Cutler and any other career practitioner in, to, in terms of how they perform their practice. So you and I can go to the same workshops, collect the same tools, but we will use them differently. And that becomes who we are as a career development practitioner, bringing our own personality into it, our own personal experience into it, and that is how we develop the art of career development. Just using the same tool in the same way with, the, with different clients is not going to develop an art, it's just going to perpetuate the science. So that's the how. Now the why is something different because the why to me includes the purpose of why we do what we do. So some of you may have a purpose in life. Some of you may take time to reflect on what that purpose is. Some of you may even have written it down. For me, my purpose in life, and it changes over time by the way for me, so right now my purpose in life is to create possibilities for individuals and organizations to become extraordinary. Now what I mean by that is, the things that you and I do on a day-to-day -day basis are ordinary. They're ordinary because we do them all the time. Even though people external to us might consider what we do to be extraordinary, and we might even think what we do is extraordinary. Because it's, we do it every day, it's actually an ordinary part of our life. It's part of our routine in some respects. So a really great example of this is uh, Netflix. By the way, um, <laughs> I don't have, my wife and I don't have cable TV. And we used to go get videos from the local library. And when the pandemic hit, of course, libraries closed and we couldn't get local videos anymore. So we decided that we would subscribe to Netflix. And I have to admit, I, I, I've gotten hooked. I've, we've watched a number of series and uh, I spend, too much time watching Netflix. I'm not a binge watcher, but I spend too much time. And by the way, when you have a purpose like I just described, I'm aware of everything that I do and whether or not it fits into my purpose. Watching Netflix for me does not fit into creating possibilities for individuals and organizations to become extraordinary. It's something else. But I'm aware of that. <laughs> That's really important. So. The, uh, one of the shows that I watched, I can't remember the name of it now, but it was, a, it was a documentary about the Chicago Bulls basketball dynasty and Michael Jordan. And most people would agree, even if you're not a basketball fan, you probably heard the name, that Michael Jordan is an exceptional basketball player and would be considered to be an extraordinary basketball player. But for Michael Jordan, that wasn't his perspective. Every day he went to the gym, practiced, worked out, tried to be better than the day before. And that was his life. That was his ordinary life, doing the same thing, same kinds of things every single day to become a better basketball player. We thought it was extraordinary. To him, it was just another day at the office. So that's what I'm talking about in terms of my purpose. And as a result, in this session, I'm creating the opportunity for you to become extraordinary, to do something that isn't part of your ordinary career development practice, should you choose to accept it.
the mission. By the way, most of you, even if you uh, are totally inspired by what I have to say at the end of the session, go, yeah, I'm going to do this. And by the way, there's a there's an action plan, which is a file in the session that you can download. So just go ahead and do that anytime you want. I'm going to ask you to fill out that action plan, not necessarily as, as we go along because there isn't a lot of time, but if you want to do something with what I share with you, then you'll complete the action plan. Most of us will be, or some of us will be inspired to do that right now, today. Some of us will go, oh, this is fantastic. I'm going to change my life. And uh, probably less than 1% of you will actually do something about it. Uh, and that's kind of typical with things like conferences, where we get all this great stuff, we're excited, we're inspired, we're motivated, and we go back and rarely do we practice what we've learned, except for the odd thing. I, re I mean, I realize people will go back, they might take one thing from the conference and use it, and that'd be great. Most often, there's a, there's a, a pile of stuff somewhere. So a perfect example for me is I'm a musician, and I go to a music camp every summer in Washington State called Puget Sound Guitar Workshop. And I take, uh, participants can take up to three courses of instruction. I've been going for 22 straight summers. Last summer I couldn't go because of the, of the pandemic. And so I've gone to, I don't know, 60 classes over the years. I've got a three inch binder full of notes that I never look at. <laughs> Does it ruin my experience of going to music camp? Not at all, but it's something that just happens. And, and same thing with conferences. I've gone to tons of conferences and there's lots of stuff that I thought, oh, this would be great, but I've never used. The choice is up to you. So that's the how and the why of the art of career development. And I've created a model called REACH, that's the acronym for it. And we're gonna go through these, these five uh, aspects of the model uh, to see what resonates for you. So I hope that works for you. I'm kind of looking at the chat here and um, <laughs> octopus. I haven't seen octopus. Oh, I, actually I did. Yeah, we did. That was a great story. I don't want to get distracted by looking at that chat. So the, uh, the model, the reach model, this, this is for you. This is not necessarily for your clients. This is a tool for you to change your life. And by the way, I know that there are people who, work incredibly hard at trying to keep their personal life separate from their professional life. I don't know how you do that. I have a balance in my life. I mean, I, I love to spend time with my wife. I love to play music. I hang out with my friends. And, uh, you know, I, I, have a, I do have a balance. But I'm also an entrepreneur. So as an entrepreneur, you know, I could be working Sunday night, preparing for a talk that I have on Monday morning. Or... I might not work for four weeks in a row, or I might work every day for two weeks in a row. So it really, it really varies. So I have to make sure that I create balance in my life. But one thing I'm very clear about is how I show up in my life determines how I show up in my practice, in this case as a speaker and a trainer. So if I'm not taking care of myself in my life, then that's going to manifest and show up in the way I practice. And we're going to get into a little bit more of how that works. But if you think that, well, I'm, you know, I've got all this going on in my personal life and I, I really don't want to deal with it, can't deal with it, won't deal with it, but I'll still be, you know, 100% here in my professional life, I'm here to tell you that doesn't work. I'm here to tell you that your clients will feel that. They'll sense that. And we'll talk more about that as we get into the model. So reach, R. R is for, I just saw somebody saying that the, is it my, I hope it's not my uh, plan that isn't working, because I, I, I think it is. I hope you can download the plan. If not, I'll have to give it to you after. Um, so the R in reach stands for risk risk-taking. I shared the story with you about how I was going to show up today. I'm taking a risk. I'm not doing the ordinary thing that I would normally do at, at a Connexus conference. I always have a PowerPoint presentation. I don't, if you've been in my sessions before, they're mostly pictures, very few words, and I'm still engaging with the audience, but it's there. 
Uh, I always have my notes out on the table just in case I forget something and I turn back to them. I have no notes here. Um, so this is something different. So I'm taking a risk. I've also had to change how I do business since COVID started. So uh, the middle of March of 2020 was the last time I had a face-to-face -face training session up until November. So what did I do for those months? I learned how to become a virtual presenter by taking a bunch of different courses, by learning how to show up and look good on camera, by looking into the camera and engaging with people that way, and a whole bunch of other things, learning different platforms, and I'm now moving my business, my entire business online, which will, and, I'll, and actually I'll be, I'll be um, uh, sending notices to folks uh, shortly about how that's, what that's gonna look like. It, it should be a broadcast fairly soon, I hope. So that was taking a risk, you know, what was, I sat back, well, what am I going to do now? You know, I can't, I can't speak to face to face. I can't do training face to face. I can't play music for anybody. So I needed to do something different. And that's what I chose to do. That was a big risk for me. And I'm not sure if it's going to work, work out yet. It may not. I don't know. We'll soon, we'll see. So if I'm not taking risks in my own life, if I'm not pushing myself to the edge, how can I expect my clients to take risks? And isn't much of what we do getting our clients to take risks? You know, we're asking them to do things that they're not, they don't usually do, things that are not in their ordinary walk of life. It might be cold calling. It might be, you know, ha having after having worked uh, in the trucking industry for 25 years, they have to go back to school and learn something different because there's no jobs in that industry anymore. That's a huge risk for those people. <clears throat> and as practitioners, you know, we're trying to encourage people to do those things. But if you're a person who doesn't take risks in your own life, in the back of your head, somewhere, it might be saying, hmm, I'm telling this person that they might have to move to get this job, but I wouldn't. I'm telling you folks, you may not realize it, you may not be aware of it, but that kind of thing will come out. The, the clients will feel that, you know, this person who's sitting across me telling me to take risks, I don't see him or her as someone who is actually a huge risk taker. In fact, some of the things that he or she have said have been very conservative. And so that is going to hinder the client from taking that leap. You know, feeling, okay, if this person across the, you know, across the desk from me can do it, so can I. So I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you. That's why I said this, this uh, 40 minutes could change your life if you let it. I'm going to challenge you to go into the document and think about, you know, uh, what kind of a risk that you can take in your personal life in the next 15 days, something that's been bugging you, something that you know needs to be resolved or addressed. And I want you to write that down in the action plan. And I want you to think of the same thing at work. What kind of risk can you take? Maybe it's, maybe you work in a team. Maybe there's some things that are going on in that team that are not working well and you're not speaking your truth. That's a risk for you to say something about that. It might risk your job. Maybe there's something going on with your client that you're afraid to tell them for whatever reason. You need to tell them. You need to take that risk. So I'm going to challenge you to take two risks in the next 15 days, one personal and one professional. All right, the E. The E stands for engagement. And folks, this is huge. Um, you've all heard the word. You all have different interpretations of what the word means for you. For me, I've been in this business. I, I've had a, a private counseling practice for many years. I've been a teacher for many years. And in my experience, I've been a street worker with at-risk kids. In my experience, I cannot affect change 
with someone without having a relationship. I shouldn't say that. I probably can. Uh, so, for example, you know, someone might come, someone might come to a talk that I don't know, I've never met before, and they might go away doing something that I said that might change their experience, which is which is great. But for the most part, on an ongoing basis, working with clients, working with patients, whatever, or youth, it's that relationship, the nature of that relationship, that's crucial. And the only way to, for me, to create deep relationships is how I show up in terms of how I engage with people. So when we're talking about clients, it's everything from their first encounter with you. You know, if it's on the phone, if it's via an email message, if it's a face-to-face -face meeting, they're, they're looking at you, they're watching you, they're inspecting you, they're judging you, they're assessing you in terms of how you show up. And so, you know, some silly examples, uh, they're, they're actually, they're not silly because nothing is silly and nothing is too small, but some, some examples that you may not think about are, are you sitting behind a desk and your client, you know, is sitting on the other side of that desk? There's that barrier there. Do you have your uh, computer? Are you on your computer asking your clients questions, you know, getting that information, taking notes? Do you have a pad and a pen on your lap? These are all things that help disengage you from your client just like if I had a slide presentation or my notes would disengage me from you right now. So my slides would be up there instead of my face. I can put my face in the corner so you can see my face, but mostly you'd be paying attention to the slide. And that would disengage me from you. You may not even realize what impact that disengagement has, but it does have some. So how you engage with your clients. You know, we give them stuff to do. We ask them a bunch of questions. We often, uh, you know, when I, when I pull people uh, in sessions, live sessions, and I ask them, you know, how many of you are doing left brain activities with your clients? You know, this sort of question and answer, analyzing, looking at results, looking at labor market information, all kinds of stuff. And most people put up their hand, you know, like it's 90% and above left brain activities. Well, some of those are engaging for sure, but some of those are disengaging. And what I try to do, if you've been to my sessions, is incorporate right brain activities like music and photography and art uh, to get the same kinds of information that we're trying to get from the other things that we do with our clients. Those right brain activities are things that will engage people much more than the left brain activities. So you need to come to one of my sessions where I'm doing some, some of those, or you need to find out what they are. In fact, uh, uh, Lindsay posted, there's an article on uh, me talking about the way I use music as a career development tool. Uh, so download that and read it. That's an example of a right brain activity where the clients that I, where I use that tool with, they're incredibly engaged and so am I. I mean, you know, two and a half hours fly by in a meeting like, like nothing because they're doing something, they're participating in something that's right brain and it's something that's really meaningful for them. Music, I mean, you know, how important is music in our lives? So, again, I want to I wanna go back to the personal life. You know, how, how deep do you engage with people in your personal life? And you can... Look at the circle everywhere from a partner, if you have one, to your inner circle, which would be your, you know, your, family, your close family, close friends, more acquaintance type folks, colleagues, strangers. How, what, you know, what, only you can answer that, and I've given you a sort of a rating system. What level do you engage people at in your life? What level do you think you're at? And if you're a four or five, what do you think you can do in the next near future to become a five or a six or a seven. What can you do to engage more in your life? So for me, this has come up that, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm from Montreal originally. I moved away as soon as I could. <laughs> and to some degree, they're kind of estranged with some of my family because um, geographically, we've been apart. And philosophically, I'm apart. And I love them all. They all love me. but. If I don't initiate contact with them, I don't hear much back from them. So 
my level of engagement with my family is very poor and it's something I keep promising myself I'm going to get better at and I did it again uh, just yesterday I'm taking a course through a men's organization they belong to uh, it's learning how to enroll people not to register them in a course or anything like that but how to get them excited about what you're doing in your life and uh, I want to, to make it work better with my family yet again so I've got another plan and I'm going to start to call members of my family to engage at a deeper level that's what I'm talking about in terms of using my personal life and doing things in my personal life that help me show up here so I have no problem talking to you with just my camera because I'm comfortable with the level of engagement that I have in my personal life with people. I'm willing to go deep. I'm willing to be vulnerable, open my heart, and let them see who I am. And the same thing is going to happen in a training session. If you've been in one with me, you already know that. So that's why on this form, I'm asking you, in this action plan, I'm asking you to do both. You know, what level of engagement do you think you're at in terms of your personal life, how can you improve it? Just pick one thing and the same with your professional life. Folks, I guarantee you if you take some steps to change your ordinary, it will indeed become extraordinary. Until that becomes ordinary and then time to move on to something else. So that's engagement. A, assessment. You all do that in your jobs, I'm sure. What you may not be realizing, and by the way, you're doing it in your life, your personal life as well. What you may not be realizing is that uh, you're also, unless you're totally aware of it, which I, in my experience a lot of people aren't, you're also judging instead of assessing. Assessment is not judgment. Assessment is gathering information. It's looking at what is. That's a landmark forum term if you're familiar with landmark training. It's not an interpretation of what is based on your frame of reference, based on how you see it, based on what you've experienced in the past. That is judgment. And I can't tell you how often I've seen career practitioners turn assessment into judgment. Here's a perfect example. Client walks into your office smelling of alcohol. And in your case notes, let's say the client's name was Sandy. And in your case notes, you write things like, you may write things like, Sandy has a drinking problem. Sandy came in drunk today. Uh, I couldn't meet with Sandy because he or she, it's a <laughs> unisex name, he or she, uh, you know, seemed to be drunk. That's judgment. That's not what happened. What happened was, Sandy came into your office smelling of alcohol. The reason for the smell is yet undetermined because you haven't asked Sandy the question. Um, but you've jumped to conclusions and maybe, maybe you know Sandy. And maybe you know Sandy does have a drinking problem because he or she has admitted that to you in the past. So now you're taking that past experience, ex past experience and applying it to the present of what's happening that is not assessment that is judgment you could say things like Sandy came to my office today he or she was smelling of alcohol uh, I noticed that this had happened uh, I've, I've, uh, I've identified this in a number of other meetings that we've had four meetings to be exact uh, and I didn't ask him why today that's the truth that's the truth so please when you're doing assessments, uh, don't be aware of whether or not you're just looking at what is, what's being shown to you and making a note of that or using that in a discussion or adding something else to it. The other thing I want to say about assessments, another thing I've noticed, so you know, we do this exercise, uh, many of you know that I'm uh, affiliated as a trainer with Life Role Development Group, um, Dave Redekop, and you know, we you know, train a lot of career practitioners and we have a lot of tools that we share with them, assessment tools. 
uh, non-formal assessment tools. And one of them is called My Dependable Strengths. And it's merely a tool where we get a client to talk about a time in their life, something they did where they were, that they were proud of. It actually comes from, based on Chris Magnuson's five Ps. And so in a demonstration, I'll get practitioners to come up and on a flip chart, I'll get them to write what they hear the client saying in terms of what the client's values are, skills, passions, interests. And whenever, they, whenever the client says something like that, we're doing a role play, I'm, I'm the counselor, the client is a volunteer, uh, the practitioners that I've asked to make note on their flip chart will write these things down. And almost every single time I've done it, and I've done it a lot of times, what they write down on the flip chart is not what the client said. It's not the exact words that the client said. They're interpreting the words that the client said and turning them into their own. And of course the learning that I have for them there is don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Write exactly what the client said. At the end of that little exercise we tear off the flip chart and give it to the client as a gift. These are the skills, these are the, these are the things that you used in that moment when you were proud of something that you did. You can use those skills anywhere. They're transferable. So assessing is not changing the language. It's not you making it better. It's not you taking a client's resume and using your words. That's not, to me, that's, that, uh, it, it, it's unethical, I think. And it, uh, it doesn't help the client. I've been an employer where I've had a resume in my hand and a person in my office, and the two did not match because the person in my office did not write that resume. And I could tell that, you know, in 30 seconds. So that is the engagement piece. The C stands for courage. And courage, what I'm talking about here is I'm talking about the courage to speak your truth. By the way, uh, same thing um, with the other two, an assessment on the form, the action plan, rate yourself on how good you are at doing assessments, and then determine what you can do better. Um, I, I guess I should say before I move into the courage piece, I'm a huge fan of assessments that don't cost money, and, and people who... who Produce formal assessments that we pay for. Uh, don't like when I say that, and I just, I just, I've never used them. I just never used them. The only time I shouldn't say that. The only time I did use them was when I was a high school guidance counselor, and our school used career cruising. Uh, now I'm a, uh, a an acquaintance and uh, like to be called a friend of Phil Jarvis, who was running career cruising at that time, and I used to tell him that, um, you know, I, I can't buy into your stuff now. <laughs> now. Career cruising has changed. This is going back 20 years. Career cruising has changed a lot. Uh, and I still don't use it because I don't have the need to, but I know lots of people do. And if it's a tool that works for them, that's great. I'm not saying don't use formal assessment tools like that. I'm saying uh, be aware of what value they bring and don't uh, turn your head against assessment tools that don't cost any money like using music as a career development tool or photography, which is another assessment tool that I use. So imagine this, you know, if you haven't tried this or heard about this before, uh, get your client, I, I, did, I did this back in the day when we had film and cameras, you know, so I get my client to go and take 10 pictures of things that really uh, move you in some way, shape or form. But you can only use you know, one theme once. So, for example, if you have a brand new granddaughter and that's the most important thing in your life, I don't want 10 pictures of your granddaughter, I want one. And that would represent family, granddaughter, and so on. And take 10 pictures and bring them back. Today, in digital, digital world, you can take thousands of pictures. Tell your client to go out and take as many pictures as they want of things that move them. But when they come back to your office a week later or two weeks later, just pick 10 that really move them about different themes. You know, is it family? Is it climate? Is it working in some kind of industry? Whatever it is. And then have a discussion with your client about those themes. Ask questions about those pictures. And listening in the answers, just like I do with music, listening what are their values, what are their interests, what's their passion, what are their skills. 
if any of those come up and make notes on those in their words and then hand them back to them. This is what I heard you say at this session. Is this you? And they'll go, yes, because it's their words, not yours. So you can use a tool like that. I can find out more about you from the music that you listen to that moves you than I can from, than I, in my experience, than any career interest inventory I've ever seen. It's just because music, photography, pictures, uh, you could do it with movies, with books, anything like that. Those are things that people really resonate with. And you can find out a whole lot more about who they are by exploring those areas. All right, so we're on C, courage. So back to courage. Courage has to do with speaking your truth. So, folks, um, you know, I meet a lot of people in my life, and a lot of people walk around this life not speaking their truth. They hold things in. They gossip behind people's back. They're on Facebook uh, posting uh, about stuff that they either believe or don't believe. Uh, they're not being authentic and speaking their truth. And it takes courage to do it. It takes courage to do it. Because speaking your truth could mean the end of a relationship. It could mean the end of a job. It could mean uh, the end of your working with a particular client. I'm here to tell you that the opposite, not speaking your truth, keeping it inside, manifests itself in all kinds of different ways. You know, people... Um, People do all kinds of things to cover up the fact that they're not being who they really want to be. And sometimes they go through their entire life uh, going through the motions. And it takes courage to really be you. I mean, there's all millions of examples, and many of you, I'm sure, who are listening to this, are probably very courageous and have done some things in your life where you did speak your truth. And I'm going to ask you to keep doing that uh, again on that forum. You know, is there is there someone that you need to talk to that you haven't expressed your real feelings about what's going on with you in that relationship with that person? I would highly recommend you doing that. And the same uh, in your professional life. Um, if, you know, courage and risk taking are are very connected for sure because it's going to be a huge risk to speak your truth um, so you know again the choice is yours and and like I said at the end of this session uh, you might have some great things written down on that form now or might write them down later if you don't act on them they'll just you'll just be continuing and going about your regular life which by the way there's no judgment around that your regular lives could be really really cool and great extraordinary to the outside outsider looking in but for you they're still your regular life and if you want to change that and become extraordinary you have to move beyond the regular life which means you have to push the edge and the comfort zone so that's courage and the last one is heart h is for heart um you know, I, I don't think I've met a career development practitioner in all the years I've been doing this that uh, doesn't seem to be a really good person. <laughs> the career practitioners are wonderful people. I love hanging out with them. They, most of them really want to help. They want to make the world a better place. They, they are, I think they have big hearts. I really do. I really do. And I think they have a lot of compassion for their clients. And, uh, and, and I imagine that a lot of that transfers into their personal life as well. But I have seen examples of where people get stuck with that ability to be open and vulnerable. So an example of that might be, especially for new practitioners, there might be some of you on this call, in this session, uh, feel that they have to be the expert, they have to know everything, and they have to have this demeanor of, uh, you know, I can't make a mistake. I can't show the client or my boss or my team worker or my wife or husband uh, that I don't know something. 
and it's this ego thing that we've you know and unfortunately men i'm going to say this uh, men have bigger egos than women uh, generally speaking i know it's a sexist thing to say but that's my experience and women women come more from the heart uh, again generally speaking men come more from their heads and when i come from my head uh it's okay but it doesn't have anywhere near the same outcome as when i come from my heart coming from my heart means being totally open to whatever i'm experiencing on the other side of that relationship with a client or with a, a family member or a loved one <clears throat> or a stranger it's that willingness to be curious to ask questions to find out to not give advice now i don't have to fix anybody i don't have to give advice to people what what i what i think our job is is to you know empower people to become their best selves and they can't do it by following the advice that herky cutler gives them my advice only works for one person and sometimes it doesn't even work for that person and that's me sometimes i give myself bad advice <clears throat> so when i was a therapist in private practice excuse me <clears throat> I made a vow that I was not going to give any advice and I was still going to charge people for it. <laughs> so I ask a lot of questions so that people can, people can come to their own conclusions about what they need in their life. And it's the same thing with career practitioners. I don't think we ask enough questions. I think we move into that problem solving mode too quickly. I've seen it. I train practitioners. So we do a lot of role playing and I see how, how they operate. They want to solve the problem right away. They don't even have all the information yet, but they make judgments, not assessment about what they think is going on. And of course they only have 45 minutes or an hour and somebody else is waiting. Now I get, I totally get that there's a whole um, set of logistics out there that, uh, determine what an individual can or can't do sometimes within the context of their work. I get that. But I'm suggesting to you to open your heart more. So you were hearing from people that um, they're not able to hear you right now. I'm not sure if there's something that's changed with your audio. Um, 